It's almost 10 to 8. Well, Anzac Day tomorrow, the day, as you know, we remember the Australians who've served their country in all theatres of war. Unfortunately, this year, as you know, is going to be very different. I'll tell you about that at 8 o'clock. But just consider this, between 1939 and 1945, from a population of just 7 million, around 1 million Australians, men and women enlisted, millions more served on the home front, but more than 40,000 Australians were killed during the Second World War. Think of that even in today's population, 40,000 killed World War II. Many more were injured, physically and mentally, often for life. In the Pacific region, 22,000 Australians became prisoners of war at the hands of the Japanese. They were treated appallingly. More than 8,000 of them died. Around 9,500 Australians worked on the infamous Burma Thai Railway, and more than 2,600 of them didn't come home. It's hard to comprehend the horror and inhumanity of it all. One who did survive the Burma Thai Railway line was Jim Kerr. Mr Kerr's 95. He enlisted when he was 15, so according to the army, he's 100. He lied about his age. Two years later, at the age of 17, he was taken prisoner. He spent the next three and a half years working in Japanese labour camps, including the Burma Thai Railway. And Mr Kerr says he doesn't hate the Japanese, but he also says... He'll never forgive them. He'll never forget what they did. We talked to him on on my TV program this week, and then you wrote and said we want to hear him again. So Paul and the team and I thought, well, what better day than today? So Mr Kerr is back on the line with us. Good morning to you. How are you? Good, thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me back on your show. Well, everyone loves you. Everyone loves you. They couldn't believe. They couldn't believe what they heard. You enlisted when you were 15, and you lied. You left school when you were 14. Just tell us again, what did your parents say when you went to them and said, oh, I'm going to enlist? Your dad laughed at you, I think, didn't he? Well, both of them, of course, with dad being a First World War digger, so they, uh, no, they wouldn't, uh, they didn't uh, <laughs> listen to me at first. But I passed out, pestered the melon, and uh, finally they gave their uh, consent. So you went down to the recruiting office, I mean, honestly, and, and they asked you when you were born. Yep, and when he was doing the paperwork, he came to my birthday, he said, what's your birthday? I said, 5th of 2nd, 20, which uh, <laughs> automatically jumped me up five years to 20 years of age from 15. And he believed you? Yes, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really 100, Jim, you're 100. <laughs> hey? according, to the, according to the army, I am, Alan, yes. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> now, look, just get on to this business about you being captured in January 1942 to the Battle of Muar, the last major clash of the Malayan campaign, and Australian and British forces were hopelessly outnumbered. Australians were ordered to retreat, but you were separated from your crew, members of the 4th Anti-Tank Regiment, and you you joined up with 44 other soldiers from the 2nd 29th Battalion, and you said, we tried to get food from the natives, but there were just too many of us, so we decided to split up into three groups. What happened then? Well, in, when we split up into the three groups, because the uh, we were there was forty five of us sent around to uh, attack this uh, the Japanese that were dug in on this hill when we were retreating, and when we broke off the engagement, only nineteen of us survived out of the forty five. So we uh, we were then behind the Japanese lines, of course, they were on the main roads. And uh, trying to get food for 19 men from an odd native hut here and there, we found just about impossible, so we split it into three groups. And the men that I went with, we had a a plan concocted, this absolutely stupid plan of making for the west coast of Malaya, stealing a boat and making for Sumatra. So each day we just walked and walked, making for the west coast, and uh, getting food where we possibly could, sleeping wherever we uh, where, where we could of the night, and then finally uh, we met this well-educated Indian, and he asked what we're doing. We told him, and uh, he said, "Well, you can't keep on doing what you're doing." Uh, so we had a talk amongst ourselves. I asked him if he knew, oh, and then he said, uh, "Did you know that Singapore had fallen five days ago?" And we said, "No." He said, oh, today is the 20th of February. So anyway, we asked him to go in and uh, bring the Japanese out and uh, to give ourselves up, not knowing whether they were 
taking prisoners or not. So we were on a side track just off the main road, heard the truck pull up, the Japs came down the path with their loaded rifles. We stood up, put our hands up, not knowing whether we were going to be shot on the spot or uh, taken prisoner, but fortunately uh, we were taken prisoner, Alan. And we were then taken to uh, the main prison in Kuala Lumpur, Pudu Prison. And as, I was, as we were coming into Kuala Lumpur, uh, we could see these heads on poles. And as we were closer, we could see that they were Chinese. They'd been executed, their heads cut off and uh, and put on poles around the city. In other words, the Japs were giving the Chinese population a very strong warning. Uh, don't mess with us or uh, this could happen to you. Goodness me. And then so you that's, were... That's how I was taken. Oh. So I didn't get back to Changi and the, the main surrender on the... 15th of February. Mm. And so then the Burma Thai Railroad, uh, when we had taken there, what were the conditions like and what did you do? Well, we, we were taken from Singapore to a place called Bampong in, uh, in Thailand. It was a five-day journey by rail in uh, totally enclosed steel rice wagons. Uh, we had a Jap sitting at the door and uh, fortunately the door was open, of course, otherwise uh, none of us would have survived in the heat in the enclosed wagon. Uh, so uh, that's how we made our way to uh, to uh, Bangkok, to uh, Thailand. And what about eating and drinking? Uh, well, occasionally there was no scheduled stops for eating and drinking, and when the engine stopped to take on water... Uh, we'd make a mad rush to try and uh, get some water for our water bottles and uh, try and have a quick wash. There was no toilet facilities provided, so uh, uh, no bucket in the in the wagon. So the only way that we could relieve ourselves was to uh, pull your pants down, hang your, your behind outside the carriage, the, uh, carriage door, and the two blokes would hold each arm. Uh, you do your business. They'd pull you back into the wagon, and uh, mm. and you got on with uh, the rest of the trip. And then and that's you, how we, oh we travelled for five days. Five days. And you suffered from malaria. And yeah, you I had malaria uh, twenty times. Twenty times. You said you just shivered and shook, sweated, couldn't yep. eat. Yep, that's right. No treatment, Alan. Mm. Never, never received any treatment. Did your family yeah. know anything about where you were? They didn't know until uh, March 1943 before they notified officially that I was a prisoner of war in Thailand. But uh, unfortunately, I'd been posted missing before Singapore fell. So they had that uncertainty of, uh, of uh, not knowing whether I was alive or dead, whereas if I hadn't been posted before Singapore fell, well, they would have had the hope that, of course, I made it back to Singapore yeah, and... Yeah. Uh, yeah. How did you find out the war was over? Uh, we were we were stay, well. We were working in a camp called Nakhon Nai, about eighty miles out of uh, Bangkok. We we're digging tunnels uh, in the hills for the Japanese fortifications, and uh, we were halfway out to the work site this morning. And all of a sudden, we turned around, taken back to the camp. Uh, by this time, all our officers had been taken off us, so we had a, an English sergeant major in charge of the camp. So we were told to fall in on the prey ground, and uh, he made the announcement uh, the war is over, uh, and atomic bomb had been dropped on Japan, and, uh, and the war was over. Amazing, eh? Amazing. So you can imagine the euphoria, Alan, yeah. after th three and a half years. And what about the... Yeah, and what about the Japanese? People often ask you, do you hate the Japanese? I've never used the word hate, Alan, because in my opinion, uh, hate can be like a cancer. It can eat away at you. And I felt that if I let that occur to me, that they would have beaten me. So as you mentioned early, I don't use the word hate, but I'll never forgive them for what the unnecessary suffering and the unnecessary death they were caused by their brutality mm. and lack of food and medical uh, mm. attention. And Wonderful. I'll never, ever forget that. Well, always, as long as I'm alive, 
I'll never ever forget what well, they did. Well, Jim, let me just say something to you. We'll never forget either for different reasons. We'll never forget what you people sacrificed and what you've endured. And it's just a privilege and a pleasure to know you're fit and well with us today. Have a wonderful Anzac Day. Yeah. Could I just finish off, Alan, yes, yes. with something for tomorrow? Yes. To simply take a, a moment to remember, especially this year when there are no public services or marches, and since this year is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, please take an extra minute as a nation and think of what people went through to have what you have today. We have, a, have something, Alan, that a lot of people in the world crave for, and that is freedom. Absolutely. It's, it's one word, but it means so much, and we are so fortunate we have that, that wonderful thing. Thank freedom. you. Well, I've just exercised that because we're supposed to go to the news and I've exercised the freedom to not go because we wanted to listen to you, Jim. Have a wonderful day tomorrow. Yeah, there thank he is. you very much. 95-year-old Mr. Jim Kerr.